Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this planet, and welcome to our set live. My name is Frank Marchis. I'm going to be the host today. Uh, we are going to talk about one star, only one star, but a very special star because it seems to be the oldest star ever imaged by us human on this planet. And for this, um, I, should, I should mention that I'm a senior researcher at the SETI Institute, of course, and uh, I'm going, I'm not, I'm a planetary astronomer, so I don't know much about star. So for this, this conversation, we invited two people who are leading this effort, in fact. So Brian Welsh, how are you, Brian? I'm doing well, thank you. So Brian, you're an astronomer at Johns Hopkins University. You were previously a great student over there. You recently graduated, so congratulations. Should I call you Dr. Mm -hmm. Welsh? <laughs> that uh, I've, I've earned that title at this point. So uh, if you if you want to do that, I'm I'm all for it. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> we all doctors, so let's just call each other by our first name then. Uh, thank you, Brian, for coming. And uh, close to us, uh, also at Jumps, uh, not too far away from Johns Hopkins University, we have Dan Cole. How are you? Yeah. Hi. Good. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having us, Frank. It's great to be here. So Dan, you're an astronomer at the Space Telescope, Space, uh, Space Telescope Science Institute, which is a place I visited recently, and we met at dinner, and you told me everything about these old stars. I said, well, you need to come to tell us about this at the City Life with uh, Brian. So here we are, months later. So um, just a summary, Brian, um, this, this star uh, was a, the discovery of this star was announced in March 2022. It's from an observation using the Hubble Space Telescope, and it's been everywhere in the news. It's interesting, and you even nickname it, and we're going to talk about that. It's a star which is roughly 30 billion light years away from us. So we have people watching us right now live, and uh, I remind you that we have a conversation first, and we're going to basically take later on uh, some questions for you, and uh, please let us know where you're watching us from. So... Well, questions for uh, you, Brian. Let's start with, uh, with you. So what exactly, uh, what did you discover? Yeah, so like you said, it's the, it's the most distant individual star that we've seen so far. So with the Hubble Space Telescope, we've seen galaxies that are further away, but we typically see these as the light from billions of stars that's all blended together. And we see, you know, all of these stars merge together into these little, you know, faint red blobs. Uh, but in this case, the, the galaxy that this star is in is actually magnified very highly by gravitational lensing. So it's stretched out into this long red arc. And you can see just where that arrow is pointing, um, that one little point of light we identified is actually an individual star. So uh, it's, it's one star or potentially a binary star that we're seeing when the universe was less than a billion years old. So like you said, it's, it's nearly uh, 13 billion years into the past of the universe. Uh, and it's the, the most distant individual star that we've been able to observe so far. Thank you, Brian. So good summary. So, uh, Dan, now I want you to explain to us a bit uh, this. I mean, most people believe, uh, believe that astronomers just walk in a room, take their telescope, point in the sky and see a, a star and then publish a paper. It did not happen like that, right? So maybe give us a bit the context of this program and uh, how this discovery was made. Yeah, um, so this was part of a, a large Hubble program that I led, and you know, we were looking for distant galaxies um, that, that we could study in more detail. Um, but you know, to, to find an individual star like this was beyond our wildest dreams. So you know, Brian's done an amazing job with this, um, and he discovered it, I think it was, what, over a year and a half ago. Um, you know, and at first, um, you know, we, we weren't sure, and I said, you know, let's, let's check this. But, you know, it's an exciting possibility, um, but, you know, Brian... You know, really worked at it to make sure we were confident. You know, not only among ourselves, but all our other co-authors. Uh, and then it finally, you know, saw the light of day. Um, and, and it was just in time for uh, for proposals for other telescopes, including the James Webb Space Telescope. What a coincidence! <laughs> yeah. <it worked laughs> <that well. laughs> all right. So we have people watching us from everywhere in the world. I'm going to say mention a few countries here: from Albania, Germany, Scotland, South Carolina, Portugal, Romania. Uh, Ireland, Germany, and uh, I would like to thank Sabine for the stars as well. So, 
so you found this um, this uh, star, this tiny dot in the field of view of Hubble Space Telescope. Um, how did you analyze this data? How did you find out this was truly a star? Uh, Brian, you want to take this? Yeah, sure. So uh, it started out, we were kind of looking at the full galaxy. So we could see that the whole galaxy was, like I said, stretched out into this long arc. And that usually means that the longer the arc, the more highly magnified a galaxy is. Um, so this is this one was a particularly long arc that was particularly far away. So that was kind of why we first started looking into it. And then the more I kept modeling how the gravitational lensing effect was working here, I kept finding that this one point on the arc was consistently being predicted to be at an incredibly high magnification. So normally these galaxies are magnified by a factor of 10 if you're lucky. And my models just kind of kept pointing to this one spot on this arc being magnified by a factor of thousands. So that was sort of our first real, uh, real hint that this was something really, really interesting. And then, you know, the more we dug into it, um, we, we basically found that at that magnification for this to still look like just a, a little red dot, it would have to be something so incredibly small that it was too small to be anything other than a star or a binary star. So that was how we really came to the conclusion that this is one star as opposed to something else. Okay. And so you see this star, what do you know about this star itself? We know that the star itself is quite massive. So we can say based on the brightness that it's uh, at least 50 times the mass of the sun and that it's gonna be at least a million times brighter than the sun. So it's a really big, really massive star. Right now, beyond that, we don't have too much more detail. Uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope data that we have, we just have a few images that you know kind of tell us that it's, it's very far away and that it's a star, uh, but we're really waiting on follow-up data from the James Webb Space Telescope, which is going to come in, and uh, that's going to give us a full spectrum of the object. And from there, we're going to be able to, to classify what type of star it is and get a little bit more details. Yes, I, I, I will clarify this because a lot of viewers may not know, but astronomers, when they do, they split the light, they spread the light of an object to have this kind of the rainbow, basically, in different wavelengths, in different color. And from this, people who study star can basically get the temperature of the star, uh, see some absorption bands, so they know the surface composition, and sometimes even infer the age of the star for just the presence of some some molecule, some atom that does not exist, etc. So that's the kind of study that you have not been able to do yet on one picture, but soon, with the James Webb Space Telescope, you will be able to get this more information about this star. Yeah, exactly. Um, this star is called, okay, who found this name and how do you say it? <laughs> uh, I got to pick out the name. Uh, the name is Erendel uh, and it is an old English word that means the morning star. So since it's uh, within the first billion years of the universe, this is a time period that we often refer to as cosmic dawn. So I figured that uh, a morning star name would fit in pretty well. So you're the one who named it, nicknamed it? Yeah. Yeah, I got to Good. pick out the nickname. It was obviously approved by uh, by Dan and all of our other co-authors, but uh, I, I got to pick out the name. There was no argument. Nobody came with another name or something, right? <laughs> we we, we right. thought about our names a little bit, but this, uh, you know, especially when Brian told me the whole story of of this name, it was it was really uh, appropriate. I mean, it has a it has another meaning that Brian could tell you about. Yeah, it's also the name of a, a character from the uh, Silmarillion, which is the uh, sort of precursor to the Lord of the Rings. Um, mm -hmm. So this this character from the Silmarillion uh, also has that same name. It was Tolkien was inspired by that same Old English word, um, and so you know that that kind of played into it as well. Very few people have read the Silmarillion. I'm one of those because <laughs> it's like the Bible of the of the world of the Middle Earth, basically. I read it in French when I was a teenager, so maybe one day I should read it in English. But yeah, it's a it's a remarkable book where there is stories and an entire mythology around it. So, so Brian, you read this book? I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah, I have read it. I am a, a big Tolkien fan, so yeah, yeah, I've read it a uh, couple times. It's uh, it's a good one. 
Hi, great. <laughs> I love those stories like that. I'm sorry, we diverse, diverse from astronomy, but it's good that we realize, we show people that there is also a human face and we're not only looking at spectra and counting stars on the screen. Um, okay, so the magnification is due to the perfect alignment between uh, a background, of, uh, a galaxy and the, and the star in the background, right? But stuff move in space. I mean, we do know that the, the the position of a galaxy with respect to each other move. Uh, for instance, uh, we know that the closest galaxy, uh, M31, come closer, is going closer to us at the moment, 27 kilometers every uh, 0.2 seconds or something like this, some crazy number like that. So is that going to be the case for this one? Are we going to be able to see stars all the time? Dan, you want to answer to this question maybe? I mean, I can I can back up a little bit and uh, and show my props. So this is my model gravitational lens, and we can kind of mm -hmm. illustrate what you're talking about. Um, so this is the to demonstrate the galaxy cluster that's in between us and this distant galaxy. Um, and as you can see, it, it stretches these uh, these distant objects out into into arcs. You know, if we can get the alignment just right, we see a, a nice arc there um, that could be a distant object that's that's lensed, and then and then along that arc. Um, was the the individual star that you saw, and and yeah, as you're um, as you're mentioning, things could move um, within that uh, that that lens um, and could uh, you know alter the the magnification. It could look more or less bright, um, but as as Brian could can explain, um, you know, we've we've seen it's very steady and don't expect it to change. Yeah, we've uh, we've observed the star at this point over uh, about five years, and it's stayed pretty steady. Um, Mainly the the thing the biggest thing is that uh, there's a, a smaller effect here. So the the image that you're seeing now is the the large scale uh, galaxy cluster lensing, um, which is the the main driver of this this particular object's magnification. But then within that galaxy cluster, obviously it's made up of galaxies, which are then made up of stars, and these stars can move to to where that they can sort of just align with the image of the background star and temporarily increase or decrease its magnification. So that's the main motion that we would need to be worried about. But luckily in this case, because of where the star is uh, with respect to the, the galaxy cluster, uh, it's in a pretty crowded area. So there's quite a bit of stars uh, nearby and that plus the high magnification from the galaxy cluster lens means that there's essentially enough stars that they're always kind of overlapped. So this star is always at a very high magnification and we expect it to stay that way for at least you know tens of years. Uh, it's always a little bit challenging to be you know too precise because we don't know exactly where it is, exactly how fast it's moving towards one object or another. But uh, we do expect it to be highly magnified for for tens of years. So we'll be able to keep studying it in detail. Okay. Uh, before we go back to uh, more questions, I would like to uh, th say welcome to our viewers from Louisiana, from Europe. It's a continent, but it's Europe. Idaho, Colorado, Azerbaijan, Baku, um, Leonara, Washington State, Sweden, Australia, Canada, San Angelo, Texas, Wales, Indianapolis, Delhi in India, Chile, and Niche, Serbia. So we have people from everywhere in the world watching us today to hear about Herendo and the discovery of this ancient star. But this, you know, I don't know how to say it. <laughs> this star that was formed 13.2 billion years ago. Okay. Right. Um, so, when did you realize that you had made a major discovery? Um, it was uh, it was kind of a, a slow process, if I'm going to be honest. So it was probably uh, it would have been fall 2020 that we kind of started to think that we were onto something. Um, but at that point, it was still very much so, you know, we were looking at this and the, the model started to predict that this was something very highly magnified and we didn't quite believe it just yet. Um, so it, it took a long time of checking and double checking and triple checking before we, I think we really all believed that we were really onto something big here. Um, but yeah, once we, once we figured out that this was, you know, holding together and that this was really uh, continuing to, to hold up as a, an individual star. I think we all got very excited about that, uh, about that prospect and uh, uh, about the idea of continuing to study it in the future too. So Dan, when you designed this program, were you expecting to discover something like that? 
No, I mean, this was, you know, we, we were looking for, for galaxies, um, you know, and specifically galaxies that we could follow up with, with James Webb and look at them in more detail. Galaxies that are, that are magnified by this lensing effect. Um, and, you know, you know, Brian mentioned that it, it moved a bit slow. Um, that, that's, that's not going to be an option for our, our, our JWST observations because I'm making all the data public and we get observations in August for the imaging. So this is going to be among the first observations. We're going to start getting JWST images in July. Um, so it's coming up soon. We're all very excited. Um, and then our imaging comes in August and the spectra come in December. Um, and so, you know, astronomers around the world are going to be, um, you know, excited to, to have a look at this. And, you know, we're going to we're, we're going to move quickly. And, uh, you know, we hope others do, too, in terms of analyzing this and, uh, you know, helping to, to figure out what this is in, in more detail. Okay. So I just want to mention to our viewers, we are going to take soon some questions. So if you, you can start writing them down if you want, and uh, we're going to take the time to answer to those. Um, so I'm going to ask like a bit of devil advocate here, but why is this important? Why do we care about that? So I don't know who wants to answer this. You guys, you decide. Uh, yeah, I can go for it. Um, I think the biggest reason is that we know that the, the universe within the first billion years looks very different than the universe that we see nearby today. So from what we've seen from galaxies, observation of galaxies, we know that these galaxies look a lot different than the Milky Way. They're not these you know, big, beautiful spirals. They're sort of clumpy, irregular, just barely starting to form. And we know that they're made up of very different materials. So there's been less time uh, in the, the history of the universe at this point to create some of those heavier elements that we see in stars and in dust clouds and everything else that we see around us today. So being able to study an individual star in this this time really gives us a chance to look at what these stars in the the first uh, billion years of the universe really look like uh, and in much more detail than we could before so um, that's kind of the the biggest reason for this particular object i also think it's it's particularly important because this really opens the door for observations of the very first stars to form in the universe um, these are these are the so-called population three stars which would have formed out of just the sort of primordial mix of hydrogen and helium gas that comes out of the Big Bang. And these are going to be things that are going to be too faint for even the James Webb Space Telescope to discover without the, the benefit of gravitational lensing. So with this observation, we're really sort of proving that we can detect these gravitationally lensed stars at these great distances within this, this very early time in the universe. And this really opens the door for Webb to come along and you know, hopefully give us some, uh, some observations of the, these first generation stars, which you know, right now we haven't actually conclusively found one yet. So this, uh, this is a really exciting possibility. Okay, thank you, Brian. Very good summary. So is there a mystery? Is there something we don't understand yet on the formation of stars at the beginning of the universe? You mentioned that the they, their galaxies are different. Uh, but is there anything that really puzzles us at the moment on this topic? Yeah, so the, the formation of the first star is definitely, um, you know, we have various theoretical models for how the very first generation stars would have formed. Um, but I think that there's quite a bit of range in what those models predict. So we really need a, a way to observe some of these very early generation stars to, to start pinning down these models of, how the first stars are forming and how the, the heavier elements that they form then get spread throughout the, the galaxies that they form in and you know, spread into um, new areas where they can then form into to new generations of stars. So this is kind of uh, you know, giving us a, a, another data point towards understanding how those very first stars are forming. You wanted to add something, Dan? No, that, that's a great answer. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're all made of star stuff. Um, that stuff wasn't made overnight. Um, and, you know, as Brian said, we're going to see in this early star if it was pristine, uh, just hydrogen and helium, or, you know, if it had some of those heavier elements and, and, and how much, um, uh, you know, so th this is all part of our story of, of how we got to be here um, and, you know, how elements built up over time. And, um, 
you know, I, I could throw it back to you at the at the SETI Institute to ask, you know, could there have been, you know, planets and and life back then? I mean, that's you know one of the great questions that we're not going to find out with these observations, but uh, you know, it's it's interesting to think about. We're gonna go back to this. I'm not gonna <laughs> right. you go with that, but like this, I just want to mention that people joining us from Europe. So in Italy, in England, I still consider England to be part of Europe. Uh, Ohio, Virginia, Louisiana in, in the U.S. and uh, Nigeria, Finland, Oklahoma, Athens in Greece. Wow, we have people from everywhere. So yeah, let's talk about that. I mean, we had this conversation Dan and I already around a few beers. Uh, talking about the impact of finding planet, uh, stars which are so old, 13.2 billion years old, okay, from 13.2 billion years ago. So, SETI is a search for its extraterrestrial uh, intelligence, and uh, our sun is 4.5 billion years old, okay, and we are, on, we are a civilization which is technological, biological, and intelligent. So now, if you have stars that, that forms that early at the beginning of the, of, the, of the universe, what do we know about the, this star specifically, about the presence of planets? Do we have, any, uh, can we prove the existence of planets around those stars? Is there a way to do this? And JWST would do that. That, that would be a stretch uh, to, to, say, uh, um, to say the least. Um, I, I don't know if it would be possible, um, you know, but, um, you know, there might be somebody out there someday who, uh, who might give it a shot. Maybe not with JWST, but maybe you might need some much larger telescope if it's, if it's even possible. Um, and, you know, the, the thing, the other thing to remember about this star uh, is that it's, it's, it's very hot, um, has a very short, well, relatively short lifetime of just a few million years. Um, so then that, that gets you to thinking like, well, is that enough time, you know, for life to evolve, much less, uh, you know, intelligent life? Um, and that's only, you know, that's one of the stars in this galaxy. So there are going to be other stars in this galaxy that might, you know, that should have a longer lifetime. Um, but around this particular star, um, you know, what might we find? It's, uh, it's hard to say. Yeah, but we, we are building new instruments. I mean, JWST is mm -hmm. coming. It's already flying, ready almost, right? right? We all know that. Mm -hmm. But there will be more telescopes in the future. Is there a program, an idea to kind of uh, be able to get more information about these very young stars and maybe detect the presence of planets? I mean, you know, Brian has really invented a new field of research here with this this star. Um, you know, it, in the in the early universe, um, you know, it hasn't been done before. There were a few other stars that were discovered billions of light years away. Um, most of them were sort of uh, transient effects uh, for, for the reasons you mentioned that this this lensing sort of varied and they sort of you know they got bright for a bit and then and then faded um, so we couldn't quite see them anymore amongst the galaxy um, so we you know people haven't been thinking about this much but um, you know the fact you know the success um, you know so far with uh, with JWST it's performing you know phenomenally and you know it shows we're able to build a segmented mirror in space you know these eighteen hexagons. And once you can do that, you could imagine, you know, unfolding, you know, larger and larger telescopes in the future. Um, so, you know, and, you know, we are an intelligent species, you know, we could be able to figure it out, given enough, enough time. Okay, I just received a lot of questions. So I'm going to go through some of them before we go back to the SETI uh, hypothesis here. And I know some of some questions will be about that. Um, how different is the universe? This is a question from Alex Pira. I'm, I'm going to change slightly the question. How did difference is the universe 30 billion years ago? If I project myself 30 billion years ago in, in the future, in the past, sorry, I'm so lost today with the dates, what, what will be significant, significantly different? So some of the biggest differences are that um, there will be a lot fewer heavier elements. So you know, anything heavier than helium is basically formed in the cores of stars. And in this, this first billion years of the universe, there haven't been so many generations of stars to produce all of these heavier elements. So uh, the universe is going to be formed a, still a lot more of just hydrogen and helium um, and not so many of these metals, um, as we call them in astronomy. Um, also, you know, galaxies, like I mentioned before, are still in the process of coming together. So 
instead of the the sort of big beautiful spiral galaxies that we know and love in the night sky today um these galaxies are going to be sort of irregular formed of various smaller clumps that are all kind of in the process of just swirling together to start to create these these larger objects that we know of so um it's a it's a very different place um you know much different uh components and if you were uh to transport yourself to to a planet you know within this this first billion years and look up at the night sky it would look quite a bit different than what we see today and probably the planet you would see would be there would be very few terrestrial planet because there would be not that much many heavy elements it would be mostly fluffy hydrogen helium planets like jupiter and saturn and saturn yeah exactly with with fewer of those heavier elements you'd be you know as far as i know pretty unlikely to form a rocky planet so if they visit it's the rest of your life it would be extremely different to ours because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we're made of sure. heavier elements <laughs> mm -hmm. okay <laughs> Uh, so a lot of question about JWST, guys. You managed to excite people with that. So that everybody mm -hmm. wants to know really the details of what you're gonna do. Mm -hmm. uh, give us uh, this is question from uh, Jimmy Yemin, Dog Creek. So tell us exactly what you're gonna do with JWST. Don't be afraid of giving us details like instruments, spectrum, wavelength. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> you start, Brian. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, as Dan mentioned, we're going to get imaging and spectroscopy. So the first part of the, the program for this particular object is we're going to use the, the near cam instrument and we're going to cover pretty much the full wavelength range with all of these different filters um, to, to you know take more pictures, more detailed pictures. Um, obviously, Webb has the, the bigger mirror, so you're going to get sharper images and you're going to get a lot more light that you're going to be able to collect than you could with Hubble. Uh, and then the, the second half of this is going to be we're going to use the, the near spec instrument to get a spectrum. So we're going to split all that light up. Uh, we're going to be able to cover the entire wavelength range of near spec. So uh, it's about one micron to five microns. And we're going to be able to, to split that all up and uh, into its component parts and start to look at uh, what the temperature of the star is going to be. Um, and potentially start looking for any more of these emission or absorption features that we might see around it. Yeah, and I'll just add. So in, the, in this first cycle with JWST, we're going to get a sort of a, a rough spectrum, um, like Brian said, to, to get the color um, and, and things like that. Um, you know, I mean, Frank, you were you were talking about in the beginning about you know doing some really detailed science that um, you know it sounds like it could be useful to to, to talk more about that since I don't know the, those details, but um, but that would require um, you know even um, you know higher resolution spectra. Um, than we're going to get in the in this first cycle. Um, so if, uh, you know, once we you know really uh, you know confirm it's a star even more solidly and you know get some initial details, um, then we can go back and, and really you know get the the fine you know spectrum and see all these different lines and things. Okay. So uh, how many hours do you have of JWST for this specific uh, star? It's what, thirteen or fourteen. Um, that's what's the with the imaging and the uh, spectroscopy combined. Okay, great. Um, um, so we have more questions about how you calculate the redshift. So let's do that. How did you calculate the redshift of uh, of this star since uh, you don't have um, a spectrum? You want to sure. take that? So uh, you can basically use the the colors that we get from the different Hubble filters. Um, so we get a brightness in each different filter, and then from there we can kind of reconstruct the spectrum uh, using a, a variety of templates. So we basically fit these different templates of what different galaxies would look like at different redshifts to the, the colors that we do have. Um, and with that, we're able to, to get a redshift. We're, we're kind of lucky that this is at um, such a high redshift because the, uh, there's a very clear spectral feature where neutral hydrogen uh, in the intergalactic medium that's you know sort of surrounding most of these galaxies really absorbs all of the light that's bluer than uh, this one particular hydrogen line. Um, so we're able to, to pretty clearly identify where that break is. Um, it's, it's really obvious there's a, a really bright part here and then it hits this certain line and then just drops off and then we get almost no, uh, no light coming in in the, the lower wavelengths. So, um, 
with that feature in particular, we're really able to, to identify it. Um, and I can see the, the question on the bottom, the, the exact redshift number that we have is 6.2 with the, the photometric redshift. That's correspond to 900 million years after the Big Bang. Yep. I, I got that from your paper, by the way. I, I cannot make this calculation in my head. <laughs> Very great. Uh, we have one minute only. I just have a question for you to uh, kind of conclude. Um, a bit more personal. Um, Brian, what's the next step for you? So the, the next thing that I'm doing is I have a postdoc lined up at uh, the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. So I'm going to go there starting later this summer and continue working with the James Webb Space Telescope and looking at gravitationally lensed galaxies uh, and the star as well. And, you know, continuing, uh, you know, poking at the, the early universe with gravitational lensing and seeing what more uh, fun stuff I can find. Good. And you, Dan, what about you? Are you looking for a student to continue uh, to basically use the JWST uh, to observe with JWST? What's the next step in your, in your career? In this project? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I hope to, to keep working to, to, with Brian. Uh, and, but also, yes, I'm, I'm getting a you know, new student, new postdoc. Uh, you know, we have, a, we have a great team of people who uh, explain stars to me and, and things like that and spectroscopy. Um, yeah, and this is going to be such an exciting stump, summer. Um, you know, starting to get data soon from all these different programs we're involved in. And, um, you know, again, you know, look forward to, uh, to all of this coming out in July. There'll be the first big press release for you. You'll see, you know, images uh, and other data coming out. Um, it's going to be amazing. I'm just so looking forward to it. All right. Thank you to both of you. Thank you for uh, telling us about Randall uh, today. And I hope to have you uh, soon on the, another City Live to talk about JWST, to talk about uh, more work you do in the study of... Uh, high redshift galaxies and the stars. It's, um, I think it's incredible that we're reaching the point where we can see a star for only 900 million years after the Big Bang. It's crazy what you think about it. Mm -hmm. So congratulations to both of you. Brian, congratulations for your PhD. Well deserved. And uh, see you soon. I would like Thanks to... So uh, this to uh, yeah, I would like to say, to remind the people that this is the SETI, uh, SETI Live from the SETI Institute. Uh, we can, you can visit our website at SETI.org, uh, know more about astrobiology, uh, our program uh, in education and outreach. Uh, if you feel inclined and uh, you feel generous today, you can make a small donation. Go to SETI.org slash donate. And uh, this funding that we receive as a donation will be used to uh, get uh, better tools to do uh, SETI Live. We, have been, we are using a new one and seems to work well or paying a trip to uh, Brian to come to talk to us uh, during one of the city talk in the future, etc. Stuff like that. If you want to hear more about science, astronomy, astrobiology, uh, join us, join our social media, uh, like this video, of course, and we can comment. We will take the time to answer to your questions. So thank you again, guys, and uh, see you soon in Baltimore or elsewhere on this planet. Yeah, hope so. Great talking to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.